This is Kate Marketless, and I'm going to be talking about vampires and their feeding habits. The most iconic vampire tale is the story of Dracula. Count Dracula is a vampire who is the main character of the novel Dracula, published by Bram Stoker in 1897. Stoker actually named his vampire after a real historical figure, Vlad Dracula III, ruler of Romania in the 15th century. His image is shown in the far left. His nickname was Vlad the Impaler because his favorite form of execution was to impale his enemies on stakes. There are even tales of Vlad dining among his impaled enemies, dipping his bread in their blood, and then eating it. Whether or not that's true, there's no question that Vlad was a bloodthirsty ruler. The story of Dracula has stuck throughout the years. The middle image shows a 1958 film adaptation of Dracula, and the image on the far right shows a modern animated version of the tale. Besides the historical connection between vampires and blood, there's a medical condition connected to vampires. Cutaneous peripheral is a blood disorder caused by a deficiency of an enzyme in heme biosynthesis. For those of you who don't know, heme is a peripherin. Peripherins are planar ring structures with a central metal atom. For heme, that central metal atom is iron. Heme is a structural component of hemoglobin, which is the oxygen-carrying protein of red blood cells. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen molecules, and there are approximately 270 million hemoglobin molecules per red blood cell. In individuals with cutaneous peripheral, the heme intermediates accumulate in the skin and generate cytotoxic radicals when exposed to sunlight. Consequently, people with this disease were thought to be vampires because of the blisters on their skin as a result of sun exposure. So now that we've looked at some theories behind vampires, I'd like to move forward into the anatomy of vampire feeding. The first question I'd like to pose is, what teeth do vampires use to feed? So first, I'd like to go through some terms I'll be using on the next slide. The maxillary teeth are here. Um, the maxillary teeth are those that are associated with the maxilla. And then the mandibular teeth right here are those that are associated with the mandible. And then the crown is the part of the tooth that is above the gum line, and then the root is the part of the tooth that's below the gum line. Humans have uh, four types of teeth, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, and the structure of the teeth assists in their function. And so incisors and canines are located anteriorly in the mouth toward the front, and they have part pointed and sharp crowns in order to bite into the food. Premolars and molars are located posteriorly, which means toward the back, and they have rounded and flat crowns in order to chew and grind food. Humans have four maxillary and four mandibular incisors, two maxillary and two mandibular canines, four maxillary and four mandibular premolars, and six maxillary and six mandibular molars. Vampire fangs are typically represented as extended maxillary canines. The average maxillary canine crown length for a human is 9.9 .9 to 10.83 millimeters, and vampire fangs are typically represented as being 6 to 8 millimeters longer than that. And so the vampire fang crown length is approximately 16 to 19 millimeters. There are some exceptions as to where fangs are placed depending on which vampire adaptation you're looking at. For example, in true blood, the fangs are represented as extended maxillary lateral incisors. At least they have fangs though. The twilight vampires don't have any fangs, but a lot doesn't make sense in the twilight world. The next question I'd like to look at is what blood vessels do vampires drink from? Um, humans have our two types of blood vessels, arteries and veins. Um, arteries are carrying blood away from the heart because they're carrying blood away from the heart, they are under high pressure. Arteries typically carry oxygenated blood with the exception of the pulmonary artery, and arteries are located deeper in the body. As arteries travel away from the heart, they branch off into smaller arteries, then into arterioles, and then into capillaries, which are here. Capillaries is where gas exchange happens with the tissue that they're innervating. Then the capillaries merge back together to form venules into smaller veins, and then into veins. Veins are carrying blood back toward the heart. They're now under low pressure and they have valves in order to prevent the backflow of blood. Veins usually carry deoxygenated blood with the exception of the pulmonary vein. And veins are located superficially, which means towards the surface. 
So now let's look at the major veins in the neck. The jugular veins are returning blood to the heart from the brain, neck, and face. We have a left and a right internal jugular vein located here, and a left and a right external jugular vein. The internal jugular veins are deep, and they're protected by the sternomastoid muscle, which is 6.6 .6 millimeters thick. Consequently, the internal jugular vein is going to be about 20 to 30 millimeters beneath the surface. That number that I found was from procedural information about inserting venous catheters. The external jugular veins are superficial and they're only about 5 to 7 millimeters beneath the surface. The common carotid arteries are the major arteries in the neck. We have a left and a right common carotid artery. Uh, they too are or they're supplying blood to the brain, neck, and face, and they are protected by the sternomastoid muscle again. They're located medial to the internal jugular vein, and they're about 30 to 35 millimeters deep. I have an asterisk there because that number is my estimate. I was deep into PubMed, but I ended up not finding a specific number for that. Apparently, finding out how deep blood vessels are isn't common information to publish. And so some conclusions we can draw. Um, if the vampire is making a two-fanged bite mark, then the vessel that must be hitting is equal or less to the length of the extended distance of the crown. So it must be less than or equal to 6 to 8 millimeters beneath the surface. So the external jugular vein will satisfy this condition as it was 5 to 7 millimeters beneath the surface. The internal jugular vein and the palm and carotid artery were far too deep to be hit. If the vampire is showing a full impression bite mark, then the vessels it must be hitting is equal or less to the length of the total crown length. So remember that the total crown length of the vampire canine is 16 to 19 millimeters. So in this case, the external jugular vein again can be hit. The internal jugular vein might be too deep, but if you have a vampire with really long fangs and a victim with a shallow internal jugular vein, then it could be hit. The, nonetheless, the common carotid is far too deep. Here are my sources. And if you made it through this whole video, thank you for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me via email. I wish you all the best. Take care.